So today I want to do a uh, brief presentation on uh, 1T OTP. So this is a one transistor, uh, one time programmable memory. Uh, and to summarize where it's being used from a market perspective, it's being used across uh, three main kind of usage scenarios. Uh, the first on the far left is uh, for key storage, for digital content. So uh, customers in the space of uh, digital, digital uh, uh, imaging would use this for HDMI key storage, for example. Uh, the second application segment is for calibration and trimming, mainly for things like oscillators and PLLs and many different types of designs. And the third is what we call uh, elimination of ROM respins. So this is a, as a ROM replacement. So essentially the OTP is used for ROM storage so that uh, the firmware can be stored in OTP, don't have to go back and do ROM respins uh, at a later date. So it saves uh, time to market advantage as well as uh, saves on mass cost. So uh, the technology, so uh, Sidens has a one transistor uh, OTP cell, which makes it very, very small. How we do this uh, transistor cells is what's called anti-fuse. So we actually blow a fuse in the gate oxide, in the thin gate oxide of the, uh, of the uh, process. So if we're on a, for example, a 180 nanometer process, this would be a 1.8 volt uh, gate oxide that we're actually forming the fuse in. But we use uh, the IO oxide as a barrier so that we always form the, uh, the bit cell actually over the, the, the thin gate region and always over the channel so we get a nice consistent uh, bit cell current. Um, the beautiful thing of this, this uh, architecture is it's very easy to scale it across process nodes from 180 all the way through uh, even FinFET. Uh, it scales nicely, very easy to port, uh, and compatible with these processes. And standard CMOS, meaning we don't add any additional masking steps, no additional um, uh, process kind of tweaks or anything like that. It's, uh, it's done with standard bulk CMOS. Uh, and also what's important here is that it doesn't actually use things like uh, MIM caps or deep end well, so it is purely a uh, base CMOS process. As a result of the one transistor bit cell, it's nice and small, um, and you can then scale it from a very small number of bits uh, for trimming all the way up to um, ROM replacement uh, sizes in the megabits uh, and still have a very competitive um, size in terms of area. And then from a security perspective, it's also nice because once you uh, form the antifuse, it's not uh, easily visible and it's not easily detectable in terms of what's been stored in the, uh, the spe specific memory locations. So we have lots of customers that would use this to replace uh, technology like a, a normal fuse because a fuse is not as secure um, and it's visibly, it's visibly detectable. And uh, the other thing here is because of the one transistor bit cell, uh, you can actually use this for things that would traditionally be multiple time programmable. So for example, if you're using double EEPROM or flash, um, you could use this to replace that and still wind up with a competitive size in terms of your macro, uh, which makes it uh, cost competitive for a very large SOC design. So just a uh, kind of a brief overview on side ends. Uh, so we've been around for 10 years. Uh, in those 10 years, we've got uh, more than 120 unique customers. And with those customers, uh, there's more than 360 design wins. Uh, and uh, 120 patents cover this technology. So we've, uh, we've patented it. We've used it uh, extensively with lots of customers across many different application segments. And we've ported it to um, more than 40 different process technologies. Uh, these are uh, some of our foundry partners like uh, TSMC, Global Foundries, UMC, SMIC. So uh, quite extensive list of foundry partners and IDMs that we've ported this technology into their, their CMOS process. So the architecture I'm going to talk about uh, a bit further today is what we call SHF. Uh, all these other architectures that are described here in, the, in this uh, slide are actually utilizing the same bit cell that I talked about, this one transistor bit cell, but around the, uh, the bit cell is control logic circuitry, uh, the programming, uh, the uh, actually programming controller that's used to program the memory, and those things change based upon process. So if you have a thin gate oxide, a very advanced process, uh, the, the core oxide is actually much thinner than an older process. As a result, the charge pump uh, for used for programming would change. Uh, but 
the bit cell itself would remain consistent across these different architectures. So SHF is the architecture that we use for the advanced nodes. It covers from 40 nanometer all the way down through 20, and it's the same architecture that we'll use for FinFET as well. So it's, um, it's basically the architecture that's used for all the advanced nodes while these other architectures are used for uh, some of the older nodes. So SHF, uh, the diagram here on the right-hand side shows uh, several blocks. These all compose uh, our deliverables uh, for this, this memory. So it's not just the memory core that we deliver, which uh, is delivered in the, this red block here signifies the memory core. It's delivered as a hard macro, uh, but we also deliver some other blocks that make it easy to integrate this into your design. So the, uh, the top integrated power supply is an optional block. It's also hard macro deliverable. It uh, is delivered to customers who want to program perhaps in the field um, and use an onboard charge pump versus providing the programming voltage from external. Then we also provide a uh, device access port. Uh, this, this is basically a uh, port that uh, simplifies the interface into the memory as well as to the charge, charge pump system. And we also provide a programming controller. Uh, the, the device access port and the programming controller are both provided as RTL codes so they can be synthesized in your design and integrated into your design more easily. Uh, I should say that the integrated power supply also has several options so that uh, we have customers uh, for say small bit count memories that just want to program one bit at a time. Uh, for larger bit count memories you may want to program multiple bits in parallel. It all depends upon the charge pump and the size of that charge pump. So it can be scaled to program multiple bits in parallel. So I mentioned earlier on about emulated MTP. So this is a, a usage scenario that we see in the marketplace where customers will use the OTP, which is truly a one-time programmable memory, but they'll write into a new location to emulate MTP. So the, because of the size being very small and because it runs in standard CMOS, and you don't have the additional processing steps that you would, for example, for a flash, you could use this to replace flash, keep the cost down, and because the bit cell is very small, you can emulate uh, pretty pretty good sized uh, memories. So for example, if you were programming a uh, uh, calibration or a lookup table of some sort, it'd be very easy to write into a new location that number of bits, whether it's 128 bits, 1K bit, 2K bits, and you could write that for a, you know, a number of usage scenarios, say 10 times, 20 times, and you do that with OTP, and uh, still have a, something very competitive in terms of overall size. The other uh, interesting uh, usage of our macros is we have uh, various read modes built into the memory, and the read modes allow you to read using uh, the memory in what we call either single cell, which is you have one physical uh, bit for every one logical bit, or you could use it in redundant mode where you actually have two physical uh, bits for every one logical bit, or in differential redundant, or sorry, redundant uh, differential where it's basically four uh, physical cells for one logical bit. And in these different usage scenarios, uh, as you move from, say, single cell to redundant, you get the capability to read across a wider voltage range, but also read faster. And um, you could also read um, basically in a very leaky process, something that, uh, you know, as you moved into the advanced process nodes, they become leakier. You can cover some of that uh, leakage by using redundancy, for example, in, in the bit cell. And those are built into every one of our macros. They're configurable on the fly so that customers can actually arrange and use the macro how, they're, um, how they see fit in their specific SOC design. Okay. One other thing I wanted to mention here is that uh, we have customers that actually use OTP for time to market. So basically they, they uh, use the OTP in their, in their SOC design. They then um, get, to, get to market after the, uh, the firmware is frozen. They'll decide that they want to ROM a portion of the OTP. So we can actually convert the OTP to ROM by a single mask, a diffusion mask. And that allows them then to basically reduce the programming time, but still have uh, that time to market advantage with the OTP uh, and the flexibility to change code for different cu customers if they see fit. Okay. So this is an example of a, uh, a wireless processor. And in this scenario, what we're using uh, the SHF macro for is various uh, usage scenarios. So, so you could have it being used for encryp encryption keys. You could actually be using it for boot ROM or secure boot. 
And in addition, you could be using it for trim, uh, for trimming, say, the calibra the trimming or calibrating your analog in your SOC design. So all these usage scenarios are, are actually uh, handled by one macro, and those various read modes I mentioned earlier are used to basically allow that to happen for uh, these different uh, scenarios, okay? So if you look at our roadmap, uh, SHF covers from 40 nanometer all the way through uh, FinFET designs. Uh, 40 nanometer and 28 nanometer are fully qualified at TSMC through uh, TSMC 9000. So it's basically their uh, three lock qual, uh, do HTOL, HTS. Uh, so it's fully qualified to their standard, which is also compatible with uh, JETIC standard for qualification. Uh, and our 20 nanometer uh, products are actually out. We have full, fully functional silicon, and we've passed uh, 1,000 hours of qualification testing on those as well. And next up for us is uh, 16 nanometer FinFET, which uh, is out of fab. Uh, we have test structures in-house. We're just starting our testing on that now. So you can see that uh, the, the one, one transistor bit cell, the antifuse technology, really allows you to scale um, along with the various uh, process nodes very quickly. So um, it allows us to, to be lockstep with customers, even in the most advanced process nodes. Okay, so from a business model perspective, uh, what we're licensing is a hard macro. That hard macro, it could be as small as a few bits, uh, say 16 bits, all the way up to several megabits. And uh, it comes, uh, depending upon the, the process node, um, it, it comes with the cr programming controller as well as the, uh, the IPS if that's required. IPS is the, the charge pump required for programming. So that could be, uh, that's part of the licensing model that we have. We provide um, all the views that you would need to integrate that into your SOC design including uh, full GDS as well as an LVS netlist. So uh, we're one of the, uh, the suppliers out there that actually provides the most extensive list of deliverables to make it easy to integrate this into your SOC design. Uh, and then from a licensing model, it depends upon the customer, but we, we essentially license uh, to a specific design or multiple designs depending upon the customer's needs and what their roadmap is for their products. So in summary, uh, what you should remember SideEnds for is we have an OTP solution that runs in standard logic CMOS. There's no additional mass steps. There's no, uh, no processing adders uh, for this technology to, to run in these uh, nodes from 180 all the way through FinFET. And uh, we are the leader based upon our area. So the one transistor bit cell allows us to, to produce macros that are very uh, small in terms of overall area, allows us to fit into many different, even very, very cost sensitive designs like uh, sensors, uh, which are very cost, uh, you know, uh, minimal cost structure for those types of designs. And um, we can scale from 180 nanometer all the way through 20 nanometer and uh, cover multiple foundries, multiple process flavors, and technology codes uh, for those various uh, process technologies. So that's what you should remember SideEnds for. Thank you very much. Hey, Tom, any questions for Tom? What, I, I'm not sure if you've already talked about what What process nodes are you finding more increasing uh, yeah, that's a good question. importance or, or, or interest? Yeah, it's a good question. So what we see in the marketplace is that you have some customers that are leading, uh, leading edge. They, they're looking for 40 nanometer, 28 nanometer, 20 nanometer. Uh, for things like image processing, for wireless, um, say, wireless LAN devices or uh, controllers. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have many customers that are asking for uh, 180, 130 BCD processes. So these are specialty processes for like high voltage, for like power management chips for cell phones, uh, for sensors in cell phones. So we're being pulled essentially in two different directions depending upon the customer's application requirements.